and the Neptune discovery. <clears throat> so the Neptune uh, position was uh, mathematically uh, predicted independently in uh, 1845, uh, 46 by Urban Le Verrier and uh, John Adams by studying the irregularity orbits of uh, Uranus. And here, what you can see is our pictures of the, the old uh, style of doing physics. But what is, is really interesting is that first, we had this theoretical prediction of the position of Neptune. And then it was confirmed uh, on the same year, a bit later, uh, by observation. And we can draw a parallel between this discovery of Neptune and the dark matter. So dark matter is present at different scales, especially at the scale of the galaxy. And what we can see is perturbations uh, of the velocity of the stars because of this presence of the dark matter in the galaxy. In the galaxy. So with, uh, without, uh, sorry, without the dark matter, so which is the, the right panel here, what we can see is that the stars um, are moving faster uh, at the center and slower on the edges. And if we include a component of dark matter uh, distributed uh, in the galaxy, what we can see is that the stars uh, are moving more or less at the same speed um, here and at the, at the edges of the galaxy. So this is something that we can measure. And guess what? Uh, the measures, uh, the measurements of the velocity, uh, rotation velocity as a function of the radius are exactly showing this, which supports uh, the hypothesis of having this um, component of dark matter in the, in the universe, uh, sorry, in the galaxy. And then if we uh, broadoscope, uh, we have this uh, other scale that is a galaxy cluster scale. So what you can see here is uh, the, the example of the, the bullet cluster, which is a merging cluster, where you have two components, the matter component that is represented in red and the dark matter component that is represented in blue. And this is a, a simulation, but what you can see is when you have the two uh, subclusters that are merging each other, so the matter is interacting with, with the matter, but the dark matter is not interacting. So the two components are kind of separating because of, uh, because of this. And what is extremely interesting is that this is what we observe in reality. Uh, so here, this is in optical, the bullet cluster. So here, the X-ray, which is giving us the, the gas distribution, and then the lens, micro lensing, in fact, that is giving us uh, the dark matter, uh, if you want. And then what we can see is clearly this separation. And it's even clearer here on the original paper um, <clears throat> um, plots, where you can see here the micro lensing poten gravitational potential uh, with the two barycenters here, and here the gas. And you can even see here the shock wave uh, of the, the, the merging of the, of the gas. So that shows us that at a lot of scales, we have dark matter and we even have dark matter at all scales, like uh, at the universe scales. And what's interesting is that at the universe scale, the dark matter is more or less following the uh, matter density, but it's also uh, forming like uh, filaments between the, the different clusters. So based on that, we have many, many other observations that are supporting this um, dark matter, but this slide is showing us more or less what we know uh, about this dark matter, which is uh, thanks to the Planck measurement, it's compo it composed about 26% of uh, our universe uh, total content. It must be cold and stable because otherwise we would not be able to see uh, these structure formation. Um, it doesn't couple with uh, the strong or the interactional um, electromagnetic interactions. Uh, otherwise we will see it uh, otherwise. And it interacts uh, through gravitation and likely through the weak interaction. And for this, we can set up uh, one of the candidates for the dark matter, which is the WIMP uh, for weakly interactive massive particle, which is the massive particle that has all those properties. And that could be one candidate for, uh, for dark matter. Um, I, I like a lot this cartoon because this cartoon shows uh, exactly in which mess we, we are with the, the dark matter search. Because as I said, WIMP is just one uh, candidate for dark matter. We have so many others and actions are another good, uh, good dark matter candidate. But the LZ uh, dark, um, dark matter search experiment is mainly uh, focusing on the WIMP dark matter. 
And it's for this, it's a very good candidate. So we are using the liquid xenon time projection chamber technology, uh, which is a great target because it has a high density, a high ionization and scintillation yield. It's transparent to its own scintillation light. So this means that we can extract a signal from it. Uh, we have this effect of self-shielding that I'm going to mention uh, in a bit later. And it has also a high intrinsic radio purity. This means that uh, the xenon that we are using to do the detection is uh, very pure. And as I mentioned, it can also do other things like acting like particles, um, exotic dark matter candidates, and also some uh, nuclear science uh, for, for example, the neutrino less double beta decay. So here is a diagram of the uh, LZ time projection chamber. So when you have a particle interacting uh, in the liquid, it, it, deposit, uh, it deposits some energy. And this deposit of uh, energy is going to create, uh, to ionize and, uh, so, sorry, it's going to excite the medium, which leads to uh, the creation of, of primary scintillation light. This is the so-called S1 signal uh, that you can see also here. And then because of the application of an electric field on the liquid xenon volume, you have the drift of the electrons. And then when the drift, the electrons are reaching the, the gas pocket at the top of the detector, they are amplified by a, a, a much higher electric field. And then the, ele the ionization electrons are emitting light by electron luminescence, creating the so-called S2 signal that, that you can see here. So on this axis, this is the drift time. So you have the first beep, that is the S1, uh, that you can see at T0, at T0. And after some time, because of the, the drift of the electron, you can see the, the S2. So by using this different time difference between the S1 and the S2, you can reconstruct the, um, the Z position. And by using the light pattern, as it seems to be highlighted on the, on the PNTs right here, you can also reconstruct with a millimeter precision the position of the event in the XY. So the LZTPC is uh, one point, about 1.5 meter, meter high, uh, oh, sorry, yes, high uh, in, and in diameter. Uh, in total, we have 10, ton, 10 tons of uh, uh, liquid xenon, uh, of xenon, uh, sorry, and seven ton just in the, in the active volume. And when we are going to fiducialize it, so being, removing the, the edges to eliminate background, we are going to reach a fiducial volume of 5.6 ton, which is the volume that matter for the analysis. And uh, the electric field, the target electric field is about 300 volt per centimeter. And this light is going to be collected by these top and bottom arrays that you can see here and here, uh, which are composed both by uh, 247 uh, PMTs. Oops, I missed to remove this slide. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, uh, so the LZ experiment is located at the Surf Underground Laboratory, which is uh, in South Dakota. So it's about uh, one mile uh, underground. It's right here in the Davis Cavern. So you can see here a picture of the shaft, uh, a picture of the, the tunnels to, to go to the, to the lab. And here, this is a, a picture of the, the water tank. So we need to go underground to reduce the background coming from um, cosmic rays, which is uh, very important for, for us because we want to reach a very low background. So meet a diagram of LZ. Um, I have pictures coming. Um, and then here you can see the, the, the TPC that I just uh, shown you a bit before and the different subsystems of, uh, of LZ that I'm going to describe. So here, this, there are, these are like few pictures of the, of the TPC. So this, this is the TPC uh, built, uh, assembled at the, um, at the surface lab. So you can see here the PTFE reflector. Here you have the, bot the top and the bottom array of PNTs that you can see. Here you have uh, pictures of the, the, these two uh, top and bottom arrays. And here you can see also uh, a picture of the, of the grid that was um, assembled uh, at Slack. And one thing that is quite uh, interesting for uh, LZ is that we have this skin veto. So the skin uh, is the thin layer of uh, xenon that is between the cryostat wall and the, the TPC that we instrumented. Um, and we can uh, monitor it through, uh, thanks to those PNTs that you can see here. Um, and to maximize the light collection we also put uh, PTFE uh, around uh, this on the surface of the of the cryostat, and this is what you can see here. And here, more PMTs uh, that are uh, looking at the top part of the 
uh, the dome of the of the the skin. So we also have this uh, other subsystem that is called the, the, that we call the liquid scintillator veto that is uh, right here. So here we have a um, 17 ton of uh, gadolinium loaded liquid scintillator, and that is monitored by those um, eight inch PMTs all around the, all around it. And what you can see here is a picture of the uh, the liquid scintillator vessel that is in acrylic uh, here. And then here, this is a picture of those volumes uh, coming down, down into the, into the, the this tank here uh, through the, the port right here. And then everything is in, uh, submerged into uh, ultra pure water and that will uh, be used as a as a shielding for uh, neutrons and then here this is the, the the tpc coming down in the crustat inside this water tank and this is a, a picture from outside of the of the lz uh, water tank so a very important part of lz is the two skin uh, the two veto systems uh, there is as i mentioned the skin which is which you can see here uh, here i put a uh, a, do, uh, a square here to indicate the skin PMT, but the PMTs are not located at the, do, at the bottom. They are just located, they are located at the top. That's just for illustration and to tell you that we are instrumenting this, uh, this region. So, <clears throat> hey, um, Quentin, I think you're starting to break up a little bit more. I don't know if you can move closer to your microphone or that might help. Yeah. Damn it. I'm using my AirPods. Um, let me try to boost the audio settings. Is it better? Um, I think so, let's try it. Okay. So, <clears throat> oops, zoom. okay, that's good. So when we have uh, gamma uh, coming from the impurities, uh, uranium, thorium of the, the, the different materials, the gamma can interact in the TPC and escape the TPC without uh, leaving any more energy. So this, deposit here could be inter uh, interpreted as a single scatter electron record deposit. But because it interacts in the skin, we can easily uh, flag it. We also are able to flag the, the, the muons crossing, crossing the, 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 the water tank. And the alpha detector here is really important uh, to flag, for example, the neutrons because the neutrons can interact in the TPC and then are going to be captured in the in the outer detector, and then here they are going to emit a, a lot of uh, deposit a lot of energy and emit a lot of gammas. So these two systems are used in uh, as an anti coincidence for gamma rays and neutrons, and are extremely helpful to reduce the, the background. But I'm going to show you some more interesting things about that later. So if we focus now on the background budget for uh, LZ, so we have this uh, gentle based simulation framework. Uh, that we used quite a while, uh, quite a lot to predict the LZ uh, background level and um, that was uh, used also to predict the ELZ sensitivity. Um, so these two uh, plots here show are showing the electron recoil spectrum um, in, in energy and the nuclear recoil spectrum uh, in energy for the different sources of background that we are expecting. And this is one of the most dominant background at um, Low energy here, as you can see, is the Radon 222, but also we are going to be sensitive to uh, solar neutrino uh, electron recoil uh, events. And because of uh, the, this, the, the, the intense effort of screening of material, we were able to reduce the detector material background to uh, a very low level here. And here in the nuclear recoil uh, background, uh, we are mainly um, uh, the, the main co component is going to be the detector. Um, materials and also the, the neutrinos. And this is exactly what you can see on these two pie charts. Um, and here, for example, for the nuclear recall background, uh, yeah, actually the dominant component is the, uh, in this 630 uh, kV nuclear recoil is the atmospheric neutrinos. And in here it's the uh, radon 222 for the electron recall background, as you can see on this, uh, on this figure. So we need to uh, stop to reduce background because uh, we don't want background in our analysis. So to, to, do, to, to reduce the background, we 
uh, one of the routes we can do uh, we can go is to use the uh, the liquid genome capabilities for uh, discriminating between ER and NLs. This is done by looking at the <clears throat> difference in S1 and S2 signals for nuclear records and, uh, and electron records. Uh, an electron record will have, uh, will, will more, uh, will ionize more uh, the liquid xenon while um, a nuclear record is going to, to, to release more, uh, le 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 oh, sorry, uh, lost more energy into the heat channel which is going to be undetected, but the repartition between ionization and excitation uh, is more or less similar, which, which tells us that if you look at the S2 versus S1 uh, uh, plot, like, like here, you can see a separation between electron recoil and nuclear recoil, even down, down to, to very low energies. Oh, I'm sorry, there is an overlap here. So this, and this figure is a simulation showing a 1000 day run uh, which is the expected uh, duration for, for LZ. And this uh, yellow orange area is a signal, the signal region for 40 GV. And here you can see some uh, Born 8 and HTP nu nuclear records neutrinos that are uh, in this uh, region. So we are going to be sensitive to this, uh, to this guys. And so before the discrimination, we expected uh, 1,000 and 131 uh, electron recall events. Um, and after discrimination, we reduce that by uh, quite a lot. Uh, it's just like thinking about applying uh, a sharp cut uh, in here. This is not exactly what we are doing, but that's just a, an illustration here. And then we can use the veto. So I mentioned the self-shielding uh, of the liquid xenon uh, that is clearly visible on this, uh, on this figure. So what you can see here is that the events are located uh, mainly at the edges of the detector because the liquid xenon is very dense and it's going to be difficult for neutrons or electronic cords to penetrate at um, very deeply in the, in the detector. So this is more or less like a background-free-ish uh, area. By background-free, I mean a low background area. And when you apply the, the video cuts, what is extremely interesting is that you can expand and reduce uh, this leakage of uh, events into the into the volume, and this um, dashed our uh, line that we, we we are representing here is uh, the five point six so fiducial volume ton, uh, ton fiducial volume that we are uh, going to use for for the analysis. So once you uh, collect all the data, make all the your models and everything. Uh, what you can do is you can use statistics and extract limits uh, from this. So you do fits using the profile likelihood method. Um, and then this is the expected sensitivity for DLZ, um, for DLZ experiment. Um, and that's what we are going to try to achieve um, in the next few years. So then now, then now the question is how do we get there? Um, so we have two sources of information to plug into uh, the profile likelihood ratio technique. Uh, we have first the data. So we have events uh, that we are acquiring with the DAQ. Uh, we got waveforms that are going to look like that. And then we need to do some analysis and get this kind of, uh, of plots. And on the other hand, uh, we need simulation to tell us what is uh, our bio different background levels and also what the, the signal model is going to look like. So, as you can see here on the, in, this figure, in this slide, data and simulation are both very, very critical components for uh, the performance of, the, of, this, of this experiment. So we developed over the year uh, a very um, strong simulation chain. So, um, and the accuracy of the simulation is a very crucial part because this can um, affect uh, the performance of the, of the detector. So we have uh, in, the fast, uh, in the full chain simulation of the detector, two main softwares. So the first one is called Backrat, which is our Gen4 based LZ uh, detector model. You can see here um, a representation or visualization of the LZ geometry implemented in this, uh, in this framework. And we have also this uh, DER software, which is the detector electronic response. Oh, I need to write that um, software that is taking uh, all the PMT hits because we do light propagation in the in the TPC and convert that into a measurable signal. 
So the chain is uh, detector configuration with electron lifetime, background activity, sources and injection, whatever are your viable um, um, condition of the detector. We do backrat and uh, DR, um, that we are applying the two in the same step, uh, which is called here on the Monte Carlo prediction. And then after that, uh, DR is going to produce a file that will look like a data acquisition file. We are processing this file to extract uh, quantities that we are, that we are interested on. And uh, so we developed uh, mock data challenges uh, that are designed to stress exercise and test our computing and analysis capabilities. So I started, uh, I joined LZ uh, collaboration right before uh, MDC2. Uh, the goal was to produce at least six months of data of realistic RIMP search data. And we split this production between the US and UK uh, data centers. And this means that at the, at the US data centers uh, or NERSC, we had to, to simulate uh, three months of data. At that time, and based on the complexity of the simulation, three months of data mean uh, 720,000 uh, jobs, which means um, 180 million of events uh, for, for MDC2. Uh, MDC3 is a bit more complicated because we uh, wanted to have a way more realistic model. And uh, I don't have numbers here uh, because yeah, that doesn't scale uh, very well. So you can start to understand here that we have a lot of, of jobs uh, to handle and handling that just with batch script is not what you want to do. Um, and for the, the requirement that we had for the simulation are access to CVMFS because we are using CVMFS to distribute the LZ software stack. And we had a, a, back, a bottleneck memory in Baccarat, which was uh, <clears throat> forcing us to use at least four to five gigabyte memory uh, per job. Uh, which was our main constraint at the beginning of the MDC2. And the other uh, requirement we have is to write the output in a large and fast uh, storage space. So to do the handling of this uh, large number of jobs, we developed this uh, infrastructure software uh, that is more or less um, summarized by this, uh, by this diagram. And I'm going to, <clears throat> to make some poses on the different parts of this uh, of this diagram. But the main piece here is the P-squared software um, that has been developed for Diabay and um, we are using it quite a, quite a lot uh, at the moment. Uh, so, okay, so let's start with what's on the top. So the detector parameters, item and process definition. So the detector parameters are, as you can see here, for example, the all the detector parameters that you can or you want to vary in your simulation. So this is the input for uh, MDC3. So you, you have here the time, uh, which is in fake days here. And then, for example, you can have, uh, you can see here, the Radon 220 activity as a function of time. So this is something we decided to vary. Uh, we also had some variation of uh, the um, electron lifetime in the in the in the drift space uh, which is some, something that we also decided to vary and so this we encoded this in viable information into the items which is the viable part of the of the of the job and the process definition which is going to uh, more or less tell us how to execute the job uh, is independent it's a, it's a static part of the job so we are not going to vary it it's more or less um, job execution instructions uh, set of scripts to execute before, during, and after the job. Um, we yes, we have this capability of executing uh, scripts before and after the job, which are extremely important if you want to download data and to upload data. And uh, yes, uh, then this is where you can add the instruction for the data transfer and archive. Um, so the it, the pair of item and um, or execution instructions or process definition is uh, constitutes a unique ID for the for the job. So then comes the P-square uh, software, which you give to P-square uh, all of this information. So P-square is provides a restful interface for database, uh, which contains the history of each job ever submitted. Um, and what you can see on this diagram is kind of the history of, uh, of a job. So you send it, uh, it's processing, so it's in the queue executing, and it's then it's processed, which uh, which means that's all, that's good, or it failed, and then you have some some ways to reset this fail status. The the good thing is um, 
of course, you cannot resubmit a job that is processed or a job that is failed without uh, resetting or resolving the, the failed status. And when, when it's come to, it comes to ready, you can submit it again. So that prevents us to resubmit by mistake um, jobs that are uh, just failing uh, thanks to this uh, blocking mechanism. And of course, the, there is something kind of important uh, that I missed to mention here that we have uh, this definition of family, which is a group of process definition and items that are sharing the same uh, properties, for example, MDC2, MDC3. And we have also process definitions uh, that are the, the entry in the database that contains the path to the script to execute the all arguments that you, you may want, and so on, and so on, and so on. Then, as you could see in this diagram, we said there is an interaction, a link between T squared and RabbitMQ. Uh, RabbitMQ is an open source message broker software that incorporates a queuing system, and it ensures the communication between P squared and the workers. It's uh, acting as an interface. So in operation, what we have is that um, P RabbitMQ received items and process definition from P squared and put them into the queue. And then once you have stuff in the queue, it sends the, and the workers coming online, uh, it sends the items and process definition to the workers. So the workers have to be online and ask for the RabbitMQ uh, server to give them something. And then once um, the execution of the, of the job is completed, we send that back to RabbitMQ and RabbitMQ is sending it back to P-Square to update the execution status of the, of the job. Here, what you can see is uh, the active monitoring of uh, the jobs uh, in RabbitMQ. Um, here is the, in, um, in yellow, it's all the ready jobs. And in blue, it's all the jobs that are uh, all, uh, already running. So here you have the phase of insertion or publication of the, of the jobs. And here it's when we started uh, some, uh, some workers. So workers were online and asking some, um, some jobs to, to run to, to the RabbitMQ. And then here is this, this nice descent here that you can see means that uh, between this time and this time, we had jobs that finished and started to, to, to get uh, some other jobs from, uh, from the queue. One of the most important parts of this <clears throat> are the workers. So the workers are the one that, uh, that are the process that are actually executing uh, the job. That those are the, the ones that are really doing the, the, the thing. They, so they got the item and process definition from RabbitMQ and they just run them uh, wherever they are living. And then once it's done, as I said previously, they send back the message to RabbitMQ that will forward it to, um, to P squared. Um, the good thing is that with this uh, way of working, um, as soon as the containerization technologies are available, uh, the workers are able to run any on any platform. So uh, could be could run on PDSF, Cori, Edison, Perlmutter. Uh, yeah, as soon as uh, we have access to the few resources that uh, that we need. Uh, during MDC two, we used uh, PDSF, Cori, and Edison at the same time with a very good uh, efficiency. But for MDC three, only Cori. Uh, was available. And of course, Perlmutter is not uh, ready available yet for, uh, for us because CVMFS is not uh, yet ready uh, on Perlmutter. Anyway, uh, so let's take a look at some, uh, some plots from uh, MDC2 postmortem. So here this is uh, the main benchmarking that we used during MDC2, which is PDSF. So the hardware on PDSF was a bit different than uh, Korean Edison. But that's still a very good reference uh, for us. Uh, oops, the colors are not that good. Uh, and what the first thing is, you can see that the performance between uh, Curry and Edison, Curry as well and Edison, are very comparable. But you can see also very long tails on these uh, on these jobs. Uh, sorry, execution time. So that was because <clears throat> we had a bit two more jobs. Uh, running on, on, on parallel and we overloaded the system. That was causing um, a degradation of the performance in the IOs and that caused us uh, a lot of problems because here uh, a job that has an, uh, oops, an average uh, execution time of about one hour was taking up to uh, 10 hours in this, uh, in this case, which is kind of, um, of annoying. But that happens because we were uh, probably too greedy uh, on this. But the good thing is we were able to run this production on uh, PDSF Korean as well 
uh, sorry, <laughs> PDSF, Cori as well, and Edison at the same time. And <clears throat> even with this, that was kind of uh, quite beneficial. And if you if we look at the usage fraction, we mostly use Edison and Curry uh, during this whole uh, production. So here it's another version of this plot where you can see here the execution time as a function of that uh, of the date, and that corresponds to the time where we were too greedy and we started too many too many workers, and that uh, stressed a lot uh, the project A file system that was the pre uh, community uh, file system. But uh, now we know it, and we are, we are going to be way more careful uh, handling uh, IOS here. Um, so we also took a look at uh, the performance of KNL. So uh, there is quite difference between the, so we used here Edison, but Edison uh, and Cori as well have similar performance. So we can assume that's, that's okay here. Uh, so if you compare the two, there is more or less a factor of four in time, execution time between the two. And when you do the math, um, and you compare the charge. Uh, so the Edison cost us about two hour, uh, not hour, and Edi uh, Cori Kennel 19 hour, uh, which means that for us, Cori Kennel will be too expensive to use uh, for the MDC2 uh, production. And this is mainly caused because of the, this, is, this main cause is because of the memory leaks that we, we had uh, in, the, in the code. So between MDC2 and MDC3, we uh, made a lot of work. We fixed a lot of memory leaks uh, to reduce the uh, memory footprint. So we went from four to five gigabytes to about three gigabytes. We uh, also increased the number of uh, simulation features, uh, for example, the electron train. So after an S2, a large S2, you can have like some uh, electro electrons um, that are emitted from, uh, for, from the cathode that can create some, some, some signals. So we added this feature in here. Uh, and we also decided to train the bias mitigation strategy, um, which is uh, we just add fake events into, uh, into the data. So the, those are the, the big change between the big changes between MDC2 and MDC3. Uh, at the level of NERSC, PDSF and Edison were decommissioned prior uh, to MDC3, so only curry that was available. And Thanks to this reduction in uh, memory usage, we were able to use curry channel uh, a lot more than previously. And for the infrastructure, we changed a few things. So uh, first, this squared was deployed in spin to reduce the um, network uh, issues that, that we had. And we also uh, used multi-threaded you know, workers instead of single, uh, th uh, single task worker. The, this allows us to have on one node one more worker uh, doing the wall management of the of the node instead of having like yeah one worker per task. This also reduced the um, overhead that we had on the network and reducing also the connections to the RabbitMQ because when the number of connections were were uh, too important for the RabbitMQ server, the RabbitMQ server wasn't uh, able to. Uh, Take the load and was somehow disconnecting or dumping some uh, some connections. And <clears throat> we, by doing all of these, uh, P squared sc um, scaled very very well with uh, 400 uh, KNL or Haswell nodes. We we use both uh, during MDC3, and also to mitigate the impact of uh, the over subscription of Cori in the, the late of the fiscal year 2019, we used a uh, reservation that uh, something worked very very well for for us. And also another improvement we made is that we wrote, uh, we wrote the output directly to scratch. And once the job was done uh, using the post uh, execution definition, we just moved automatically the, the job. So this is another benchmarking. So um, this is the MDC3 benchmarking production. So here the execution time changed uh, quite a bit with respect to the previous one. Uh, this is because a lot of things changed uh, during the the, between MDC2 and MDC3. The main thing is that the number of events also changed in the, in the, in the jobs. But the thing that is kind of interesting is that you can see still the difference, the same difference uh, between uh, Haswell of Canada, uh, the factor four uh, that is more or less still here. Uh, but we, the, 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 good, the message from this uh, slide is that we, by reducing the footprint, we were allowed to make use of curry kernel. Uh, pretty efficiently uh, during the MDC3 uh, production. 
so let me wrap up um, the take home message for um, from the MDCs summary. So MDCs are uh, mock data challenges are very great tools to stress the data production system. Uh, during these um, two stages, we identified a lot of bugs and bottlenecks during the, the multi-cal production, and that um, helped us a lot uh, to fix them and to address them and then to be ready for the first science. Uh, for example, one thing that was really uh, important is this memory footprint for the simulation softwares. And that MDC2 really pointed us that that was a critical thing to, to focus on and to put some effort in. And by doing so, that, that, pays, uh, that paid back. Uh, by allowing us, for example, to use uh, Cori Kernel as a resource during uh, our production. Also running uh, multi-threaded workers helped a lot. And that, that really also helped to scale up the, the production because we had some so those limitations of the number of connections that were pretty annoying there. Um, also, and a, good, a great point of uh, doing these small data changes is that they help us to build confidence into our infrastructure tools because everything else hold the, the charge and the load. Even if we had like some small hiccup, uh, everything hold pretty well uh, and everything behaved pretty pretty well. So for example, the database interface worked perfectly. The automated data transfer uh, worked perfectly within uh, with NERSC. So uh, the data movement from scratch to uh, project A, uh, by, uh, yeah, that was project A by then. Uh, and also P squared was able to um, scale up after migrating to, to spin and reducing those uh, networked uh, glitches that we, we were observing. So the overall uh, summary of mock data changes is that's great. You should, we should all do that uh, for our experiment because that's clearly showing us where are the weak points of uh, our infrastructure. And I think at the end of the day, this is just giving us more confidence uh, moving toward the, um, the, the, the first science. So now we have also data production activities to support science. We have the Monte Carlo production because we still need to do the tuning of the simulation detector model, uh, which is something, something that is uh, ongoing um, at the moment. We are preparing everything to be ready when we are going to get the, the data to do uh, this tuning of the of the simulation model. Uh, we are also doing some background model pro uh, production because this is really important and some component need a lot of statistics. So this is something that is uh, also very uh, important for us to do and to support. And for the data processing, so we have two kinds of data uh, processing activities. We have the online processing. So when a file arrives uh, in the way warehouse at NERSC, we want to have this automatic uh, processing of the um, of the file. And um, we have we are going to do some automatic maintenance of the workers uh, to cover the science run and the calibration runs. And then after also we have uh, something that is more uh, by hand processing, which is the reprocessing of the data. So when, once we are going to have all the data, uh, we are going and the processing software will be upgraded. We are going to have to reprocess them. Uh, and yeah, those are the two uh, data production or data processing activities that, uh, that we are. So we are also trying to get ready for, for permuter. So uh, the, for the simulation point of view, there are some tasks that can be offloaded to the GPU and the ray tracing is a very good candidate for this. So at the level of uh, our Gen4 uh, based simulation background, we are going to, we are trying to implement uh, this optics package, which is an interface to uh, the NVIDIA optics uh, package, which is doing the ray tracing on, uh, on GPU. <clears throat> and this is uh, really interesting because if you look at this diagram, uh, this bar chart that is showing on CPU only the the portion of the CP the uh, yeah the portion of time uh, used uh, for optical simulation uh, with respect to to the rest. If we can offload this on the GPU, we can just divide it by uh, about one thousand six hundred, uh, and then that reduces uh, reduces a lot the yeah the the usage of uh, CPU and GPU, and that will speed up a lot uh, our simulation. So thanks to this, we could uh, envisage and think about doing a lot more precise uh, physics. And then here, this is uh, a diagram that shows what we, we are thinking to do. So here, this is the, the full chain that I um, 
mentioned before. So we have this simulation going on inside uh, with the light collection, uh, sorry, the light ray tracing done internally in background on using CPUs. And then what we can do is we can offload all of these two, two optics uh, directly and then get uh, the same the, the same result. So, so this is something that is uh, going uh, ongoing and uh, is going to be very interesting for the for the future. So to summarize uh, and wrap up my presentation, so the LC detector construction is completed. Uh, we have called Xenon, all the PMTs have been tested with LEDs. So the physics data taking um, is happening this year or will be happening this year. And for the dark matter detection side, uh, we are going. We are supposed to be the, the best experiment in terms of uh, sensitivity at 40 GV wind, uh, which is more or less, uh, yeah, the best uh, comparison point for for us. And for the computing uh, side, these two MBCs uh, were extremely helpful. The first, the MBC two demonstrated our ability to use the NERSC HPC uh, resources for the Monte Carlo production and processing. And MDC3 gave us even more confidence into our um, infrastructure software. Um, and with, yeah, we had all those uh, great tests, then, then we can just build up and uh, get ready for, for, for science. So stay tuned uh, because 2022 is going to be a very exciting year for us um, because data are coming and maybe some physics results are coming too. Uh, so everything, Everything has been possible thanks to this uh, very, very nice and great collaboration that is uh, LZ. Um, and uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for your attention. And I'll take some questions if you have some. Yeah, thank you, Quinn. That was great. Yeah, we're happy to take questions. Um, you may raise your hand and we'll get some get some questions in there. So it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be exciting and looking forward to either um, discovering wimps or, or or sending the theorists driving the theorists crazy by by, by um, putting lower limits on possible on possible wimps um, uh, let, let's hope we are going to see something okay <laughs> um so um yeah it was really nice uh, presentation you gave on just kind of the you know the complexity of the workflow and the challenges um to making all it all work together right um and so this is something we're seeing more and more and more of um, from various experiments and um, facilities. And so I'm just wondering if there were any, any particular challenges um, that you had to overcome at NERSC that we, could, that we could work on, or if there are any opportunities you could identify for things that we could do to make um, your life easier when trying to do something like this. So something that made our life um, way easier was having spin available. Uh, I guess for, for LZ, that was like uh, huge to have spin because we are now using it a lot for many, many services, uh, especially for, <clears throat> for P-squared, but not only. Uh, for example, we have our offline event viewer that is deployed on spin. And the, having this hosted at NERSC available 24 um, seven is just one of the greatest feature that we, we ever had. Um, oh. Right. For, the, for those who aren't familiar with spin, it's, I guess we call it our kind of an internal cloud for, for science or the other term that's being used a lot now is uh, kind of edge services that connect to the, the supercomputers and the data systems. So that's great to hear. Oh uh, yeah, Wahid. Hi, yeah, yeah, great talk, Quentin. Um, so I have a, a sort of related question, um, which is just about um, whether these services can be um, reused. I probably should know the answer to this, but <laughs> um, so the things you built, um, you know, can they be used for other HEP experiments or even other domains, like the spin services specifically? Um, in principle, yes, it's something very versatile. At the moment where you are providing um, process definition, and you are setting up the workers uh, in the right place, right environments to work with your own software. I don't see any any reasons why we couldn't reuse this for anything. Um, I don't know if you remember this, but I briefly mentioned that P squared uh, has been used by Diabay quite a lot in the past, uh, and we are inheriting this piece of software. <clears throat> 
from uh, from Dia Bay. Uh, yeah, so we we used something that was already um, already built. Okay. But uh, yeah, the main piece is this process definition. Uh, as soon as the script is good and working for you, you are you are good to go. Yeah, great. <clears throat> Any other questions for Quentin? Well, if not, I want to congratulate you and thank you again for the talk. I really enjoyed it. And um, with that, we will uh, wish everybody a good rest of the day and, and um, hopefully talk to you all later. Thank you so much. Bye. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you.